on the 14th day of October, Halloween gave to me 14 mothers murdering, 13 prices bleeding, 12 models dying, 11 Bettys baking, 10 prices burning, 9 seagulls pecking, 8 scientists sneaking, 7 Goldwyn shooting, 6 psychic scamming, 5 naked witches, 4 aliens spelunking, 3 UFO abductions, 2 deputy so-and-sos, and a masked hawk being creepy. Hey there, everybody. Welcome to the 31 Days of Halloween. This is the second full week of our shenanigans here on uh, on the 31 Days of Halloween here. And uh, we are shifting gears away from the classic horror movies that we, we've been talking about. We did, you know, not quite a week of those, but uh, close to. And, uh, of course, we started off doing Blumhouse movies. Now we are shifting to Asian horror, which... As many of you who have been listening to me for some time uh, know that this is something that is near and dear to my heart. I love uh, a good Japanese film or Hong Kong film or a Taiwanese film. Um, I think there is something interesting uh, culturally about these movies. And, you know, I, I've said this before, so forgive me if you've heard this, but especially around the early 2000s, like in, in the wake of Scream, Hollywood and, and pretty much everybody, even indie stuff, they, uh, saw Scream and they were like, oh, well, then that's what we've got to do. Because if we do that, then we can be as successful as Scream. And after seeing Scream, which I think is a fine film, I don't need to see a bunch of different riffs on that. Uh, I, I found American horror was growing stale. And that's really what led to my love of Asian horror and international horror is that I just got a little bored with what was happening here in the States. And so I started to look elsewhere. I was like, well, somebody's got to be making horror movies that I like right now. And it turns out there was a whole world of horror that I had not uh, really dived into at that point in my, uh, my cinematic career. And so I really got into uh, Asian horror in particular, which led to some study of Asian culture and uh, even the, the Japanese language because I was kind of fascinated with what made these movies tick and why, uh, why they were the way they were, you know, it's easy to sort of dismissively say like those movies are really strange or they're weird and leave it at that. But to try to understand what in the culture would produce a movie that seems really, uh, strange to, uh, an American eye, but would seem perfectly normal to, uh, a Japanese or, or Asian viewer. And so, uh, that's what led me to these movies and I'm still catching up. And so, you know, we talk about the, the three categories this year of movies that I, I try to include, uh, movies I've never seen movies that I haven't seen in a while and want to revisit and movies I dearly love. And Onibaba was one I hadn't seen, uh, you know, it's considered a classic of Asian horror cinema and I just never gotten around to it. And, uh, one of the great things about uh, you know, doing this kind of show, uh, this kind of series is that it gives me a great excuse to revisit this stuff. So, um, what is Onibaba? Onibaba is a, uh, means demon woman. Uh, the, the rough translation is a uh, demon woman. And it was, uh, released in 1964 by writer and director Kaneto Shindo. The basic premise is this, that there is a, a war going on, a civil war in Japan. There are two emperors both claiming right to the throne. And when we meet uh, our, our sort of two main characters, there's uh, Kichi's mother and Kichi's wife. They're not really named otherwise. And Kichi's mother uh, is taking care of her daughter, you know, in quotes, daughter, it's Kichi's wife, it's her daughter-in-law, but, you know, kind of makes a, a familial connection between the two. And Kichi, who we never see in the film, has been enlisted along with his pal Hachi uh, to go off to fight for, you know, one emperor or another, doesn't really matter which. Uh, the, the politics of the film is more that war in general is stupid. 
so they're left alone and, and left to survive on their wits. And as they described later, like, hey, there was a, a frost in the summer that no one expected and it ruined a lot of the rice. So they had to survive by other means. And uh, w the way they survive, and we see this like right away in the movie, is that basically they live in this field of rice, of, of tall grass rather. And when samurais show up and get lost in this grass, then they just murder <laughs> the, the samurais and take all their shit. And they go to a local dude uh, to sell it. Ushi, I think, is is the guy. And they go to Ushi's place and they're like, hey, guess what we found? We found all this armor and these swords and that kind of thing. And he gives them mullet in exchange so that they can eat. That's their gig, right? Uh, they, they do that. And then Hachi shows up, who is, you know, Kichi's friend. And he says, oh, you know, Kichi died. And the problem is that, uh, you know, Kichi and Hachi were, you know, fighting again for one emperor or the other. Doesn't really matter which. And uh, they ended up, you know, in a, in a situation where they were going to be killed. Hachi played dead and Kichi was murdered. Hachi returns home and very quickly has designs on Kichi's wife. You know, she's a, a young, pretty girl. He is a man returned home from the war. He stole a priest's garb so he would not be found out uh, by any samurai that he might run into who might press him back into service, which he certainly does not want to do. And so that sets up the, the tension. And uh, the, so the big problem you have is that Kichi's wife is sort of into Hachi or, or into the idea of not living alone with Kichi's mother now that Kichi has died and just murdering samurai like she wants something different with her life. Uh, she doesn't really vocalize it in that way, but, you know, she, again, she's a young woman and has needs and desires and dreams of her own. And, and Haji may not be the, uh, the best guy in the world, but he is, uh, you know, he's there. He is, he is somebody other than Kichi's mother. And so when Kichi's mother sees that these two are starting to make eyes at one another, uh, she realizes like, oh, I might be left alone and I can't survive by myself. And she actually goes to Hachi and says, hey, I'm going to be in a bad way if you take Kichi's wife off with you because I need her at least until the fields come back. And Hachi's like, look, that's kind of not my problem. And so into this mix uh, comes a samurai who sits upon uh, Kichi's mother while Kichi's wife and Hachi are off doing the deed. And he wears this uh, horrifying mask. And at first, Kichi's mother thinks that uh, he's a demon. And he says, no, no, no. It's just that I was so beautiful that I didn't want that to be a distraction. And so I wear this hideous mask so that uh, I strike fear into the hearts of my enemies and so forth. And uh, all I need is I need you to lead me out of this, uh, out of the, this sea of, of grass. And so she does so, you know, she says, you're going to kill me when I get done. And he's like, why would I kill you? You're not worth it. Just get me out of here. And so she, she starts taking him through the grass and there is, uh, in the, the sea of grass that they live in, this hole that they use to throw all the bodies of the samurai that they murder. And so she ends up leading this samurai, this masked samurai, uh, to a place where he falls into the hole and dies. And so she can go down after him and retrieve not just his stuff, but she takes this mask off of him, and when she does, she reveals this horribly disfigured face. Like, it's all these boils and uh, scars and stuff. And he's like, ah, well, you know, that's the face of a beautiful samurai, huh? Well, so be it. 
And the reason she takes his mask is because she has been kind of telling Kichi's wife, hey, if you end up having sex with Hachi, you're going to go to hell because you're technically a married woman. And Kichi's wife is not totally convinced of, of this, but is a little superstitious. And so uh, one thing leads to another, and ha uh, Kichi's mother dons this mask and starts trying to scare Kichi's wife when she sneaks out of the house to go have sex with Hachi and trying to convince her, you know, that she's going to go to hell if she keeps this up so that Kichi's mother uh, has a partner in crime so that they can continue to survive. Um, and then all of this leads to, a, you know, a climax in which uh, Kichi's mother and Kichi's wife are kind of chasing each other through the grass you know the, the mask uh it, like it turns out she can't take it off and there there's all this metaphorical stuff happening but so that's the basic plot of the movie I mean, not more than the 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 basic plot that's a lot of the ins and outs of the story and uh it's all in black and white this movie came out in 64 it's absolutely gorgeous one of the things that i really like about it, there's almost this hypnotic return to these shots of the grass waving and the sound of the rustle of the leaves and that kind of thing in, in this almost like pastoral kind of sense. And then you have this sort of family drama unfolding where Kichi's mother is scheming uh, against Kichi's wife, um, who, again, Hachi is no hero in this. He, he is not a good guy, but he represents something other than uh, this sort of life of monasticism that Kichi's wife would have to endure with Kichi's mother. Not to mention the fact that she's having to murder people and sell off their shit just to survive. Like Hachi can start a farm and that maybe they can have a family and all of this. And, you know, one of the things that the movie is kind of not known for, but certainly it's in the discussion is the fact that there's a lot of a lot of nudity and a lot of sexuality in this movie. And so you have to answer the question, is this merely an exploitation film? And I don't think so. Uh, there is an aspect to it as an exploitation film. Um, but in, And I don't want you to think that it's terribly graphic, like this is not pornography. But there's a lot of nudity and a lot of uh, implicit and, and explicit at times sexuality. But that's not the thing. Uh, the, the movie itself is really about war and the effects of war. And you can kind of see that too. Much like with Godzilla, um, you know, the, the shadow of Hiroshima and Nagasaki looms large over this movie. When you see the samurai's face, it is the kind of scarred and blistered face of someone who's been... Um, you know, uh, ravaged by radiation poisoning. And the same thing happens to the mother. And the sense really is that the movie is largely about how war, uh, you know, kind of destroys us all. Um, that, you know, whether it's, whether you're on the front lines or you're, you know, and, and you know, in World War II, so many families were left alone to kind of fend for themselves while the men were all fighting. But, you know, that just leads to more death, more corruption. Uh, the, the core family is corrupted because of the absence of these men. Um, and, and also worth pointing out, like one of the coolest things about this movie is the use of the masks. Um, you know, there's this demon mask and the idea that once you put it on, you can't take it off. And when you do finally get it off, it has, it has ruined you. It has made you a monster. Um, you know, again, doesn't, you don't have to look far into that metaphor to understand what Shindo seems to be saying about, um, wearing a mask of war and vengeance and, and terror. And, uh, so there's that element of it. There's, you know, Kichi's mother being this uh, sort of force of vengeance and, and manipulating religion, uh, to try to get her way. Um, and also just for my own personal, uh, enjoyment in the film, I like the fact that there's just this hole that they dump all their sins into, you know, 
Uh, I wish I had one of those in my yard. Just every time I, I did something foul, I could just throw it in the hole. But it's it's a terrific movie. It's um, it's not really slow paced, but the horror part of it takes a while to get going. Um, it, that's really more of the third act is really where it becomes a horror film. The first two acts is is a, the setup. And I really, really enjoy all of that stuff. I think the the characters are good. It, it's beautiful to look at. The story is interesting. Um, it's morally gray all the way through it. There's no, there are no heroes in this movie. It is just uh, people trying to survive in a in a terrible situation. It's a great allegory for the ravages of war, whether it's you know, the World War II, whether it's, you know, this civil war that took place in Japan's history, doesn't matter. It's just, war sucks, and here's what it does to people. It's a terrific movie, and there's a reason that it's a classic of Japanese horror cinema, all right? It, if you were at all interested in Asian horror films, it's one you should absolutely see, because all of the other directors that you like definitely saw it, and definitely learned lessons from it. Um, so terrific movie, and it's a great way to start our our run of Asian horror films. So I uh, I highly 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 recommend that you watch Onibaba if you have an interest in any of the things that I've said. Uh, if not, stay tuned because we're gonna get to some modern films uh, as early as tomorrow. We're gonna uh, shift countries and uh, and and sort of pacing and and apply a more modern style to. Japanese and, and Asian horror. Uh, so I think you're going to really dig this run of films. I'm really looking forward to it because there are some that I've I've seen and loved and am excited to talk about with you guys. There are some that I haven't seen in a while. I'm, I'm very excited to revisit. So yeah, it is going to be great. I love, I love this stuff. Um, all right. Be sure if you are listening to this on the, uh, the Dark Parade feed that you are uh, subscribing to both that and the Legion podcast feed on the podcast catcher of your choice where uh, you can find many shows besides the Dark Parade and all of this 31 days of Halloween business, uh, including Hello, This is the Doom Show and Cinema PsyOps and The Butcher Shop and uh, uh, Friday Nightmares and uh, uh, the Helming Power Hour. And I mean, it goes on and on, but a lot of great shows that I think you're going to enjoy. If you're listening on the Legion podcast feed, be sure you are subscribing to uh, The Dark Parade, where you can hear more out of me. Uh, a lot of times, not just alone, but with guests, but uh, a lot of times it's just me. Uh, I have found that I enjoy that pretty well, and uh, and people seem to like it okay. So, uh, yeah, so be sure you're subscribing to all of that stuff. Uh, also, if you go to legionpodcasts.com, you will then find uh, this post. If you click on that in the description of the post, you will find links to all of the uh, the social media stuff. And in particular, if you click on the Discord uh, link and subscribe to that server, I'm around there quite a bit. Uh, as you are listening to this, I am still going to be uh, on vacation doing my, my Halloween cruise uh, with the misses and the kids. But I will be back very, very shortly uh, to catch up on, uh, on all of this. So anyway, until then, have a great spooky October 14th. I hope you are enjoying the Halloween season. We've got two weeks and change before uh, things get real, before we do our final movie of the 31 days of Halloween. And I will see you all tomorrow for another episode of the 31 days of Halloween. Take care, everybody. Mm -hmm.